In November of 2002, a virus new to human beings was first noticed in China's Guangdong province. By early 2003, SARS was spreading shockwaves of fear around the world as the scope and seriousness of this new pathogen began to sink in. Before it was over, more than 8,400 individuals contracted the disease and more than 900 succumbed to it. While the overwhelming majority of cases were contracted in Asia, mostly China and Hong Kong, in all, 29 countries recorded confirmed cases. Not surprisingly, based on the numbers of cases, most deaths from SARS occurred in Asia. But Canada's largest city, Toronto, had 44 confirmed deaths. There was also the economic impact that accompanied SARS. While this is certainly secondary to the heartbreaking loss of human lives and the suffering of victims, families, and friends, one cannot minimize the economic toll SARS had on Hong Kong, China, Canada, and other locations which received travel warnings. The long-term impact has been a matter of speculation, but according to the Conference Board of Canada, Canadian gross domestic product dropped by $1.5 billion in 2003 due to SARS. SARS was a learning moment for the world. Many governments later admitted mistakes such as not reporting the problem in a timely manner and not keeping the public better informed. In a desire to stop the economic drain on the city of Toronto, officials declared the emergency over too soon and a second round of cases set in. I'm sure that many leaders and health officials would do some things differently if they had to do it over again. But perhaps we can expect too much of our leaders, not fully appreciating that they are only able to act on available information and past experience. And maybe we should give our leaders and healthcare officials some credit. After all, they did get it under control before it got totally out of hand and the loss of life could have been horrendous beyond belief. In many ways, the world dodged a bullet when it came to SARS. As bad as it was, it could have been infinitely worse. But did you know that SARS was entirely preventable? I say this not to criticize any individual or country. The truth is that if mankind lived by easy to understand biblical instructions, SARS would not have happened. To learn more, to learn why, stay tuned. Welcome to Tomorrow's World, where we offer solutions to today's problems from an ancient but very up-to-date source, the Bible. Have you ever wondered, why is there so much disease in the world today? Why do so many die premature deaths from cancer, heart disease, diabetes, HIV and AIDS, and a host of communicable diseases such as SARS, tuberculosis, and flu pandemics? Are there any answers to these questions? And if so, wouldn't you like to know what they are? Wouldn't you like to know how you and your loved ones can avoid disease and enjoy good health? On today's program, I'm going to show you from the pages of the Bible why it is that we suffer many of the diseases that are so common today. I'm also going to show you from that same source why SARS did not have to happen. But be warned in advance that the biblical solution is not a popular solution and few today will follow its simple and clear instructions. Will you? This program is not about pills, traditional remedies, treatments, or devices, but about natural laws that, if obeyed, promote good health and prevent disease. However, if these laws are broken, the result is disease and even death. Now we know that we're all going to die, and some things cannot be prevented. But many of our modern maladies are preventable. The Bible contains many laws that God tells us He gave us for our own good, yet mankind doesn't have the heart to obey them. 
Speaking to ancient Israel, God laments, Oh, that they had such a heart in them that they would fear me and always keep all my commandments, that it might be well with them and with their children forever. It is true that some laws found in the Bible are ceremonial and no longer obligatory. Others are moral in nature and show us that some actions in life will always turn out badly in the long run. And these are the laws that teach us how to love God and live in harmony with our neighbors. Still other laws are given to help us to build and maintain good health. Do you realize that the reasons for many of these laws revealed thousands of years ago were not fully understood until relatively recent times? Yet those who practiced them were benefited just the same. In the 13th chapter of Leviticus, we find these detailed instructions on how to determine whether a common disease in earlier times was in a contagious stage or not. And if it was contagious, the individual was to follow these instructions. Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn and his head bare, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean! Unclean! The exact nature of what was considered leprosy at that time is unclear. But what we can see is that there was a recognition that the disease, whatever it was, could be transmitted by clothing and through the air, perhaps in the form of droplets from coughing. The infected person was to warn others to stay away from him, and in some stages of the disease, he was to be isolated or quarantined. But do you realize that until germs were discovered in the 19th century, neither the reason for hand washing nor quarantine nor the way germs can be spread through the air or from body fluids were understood. Many men have died from battlefield wounds due to a lack of understanding the cause of infections and the need for proper cleanliness. Infants have died in hospitals because a doctor or nurse failed to wash his or her hands. And even today, many infections and viruses are spread in hospitals by this means, and many children get sick at school from interacting with other sick children. Yet the God of the Bible, our Creator, knew nearly 3,500 years ago about microbes and instructed the ancient Israelites to do certain things that would prevent the spread of germs, viruses, and infections, the source of which at that time could not have been understood. When it came to stopping SARS, it was not wonder drugs or traditional herbal medicines. Instead, it was quarantines, hand washings, and facial masks. In a scholarly report by Alan Xu and Richard Wong on the economic effects of SARS in Hong Kong, they write the following. One is unlikely to contract SARS from merely being in the vicinity of an infected individual. Because a virus does not appear to be airborne, however, the virus can survive on objects such as doorknobs or elevator buttons for more than 24 hours. Hence, it is possible to catch the disease by touching contaminated objects. Wearing face masks and washing hands vigorously using liquid soap are recommended as precautionary measures. Quick and effective isolation of infected individuals and quarantine of those who have come in close contact with them are the key measures for limiting the spread of the disease. At one point in the crisis, as many as 1,200 people in Hong Kong and 10,000 in Toronto were under house quarantine. Other nations applied the same remedy, and we can be thankful to those leaders who enforced such measures. Had SARS gotten totally out of control, we would be living in a very different world today, at least those of us who might still be alive. Yet SARS was absolutely unnecessary. Fear, economic upheaval, sorrow, and death would never have occurred if mankind followed simple instructions from our Creator. Let me say at this point that I'm going to take this discussion in a direction that may not at first appear to relate to our subject, Lesson of from SARS. But it is definitely related, and you will understand that later in the program. Have you ever noticed how little children will eat anything? It is amazing how we all survive considering all that we put in our mouths as infants and toddlers. Dirt, bugs, and anything we could find in a bottle. 
As we grow, we like to go for those things that taste good with little regard for balance and quality. Leave it up to a six-year-old and he might eat nothing but ice cream and candy. And sooner or later, he will get sick. But he may have difficulty in making the connection. As teens, we tend to go for the sweet and salty items. I spent a couple years living in England and every day for lunch had a hamburger and french fries at a local snack bar. While those items still taste good to me, I rarely eat them knowing that if eaten too often they will clog my arteries. Many people suffer from diabetes, heart disease, and obesity due to poor diet earlier in life. The Bible is not a book of nutrition. Nevertheless, it does address the subject of what we eat and how we live. It gives us instruction from our Creator on certain things that we need to know about food. For example, it tells us that natural sugars such as honey can be beneficial when eaten in moderation. Proverbs 25, 16 says, Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. Moderation can also mean that there's a time and a place for sweet and rich foods, such as on special festive occasions. In Nehemiah, the 8th chapter, and verse 10, we read, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to those for whom nothing is prepared. Yet today, many people make large quantities of sweet and rich foods a part of their daily diet, and the results are heart problems, diabetes, and obesity. There is so much that God gives us for good health as well as for our enjoyment. Notice Psalm 104 and verses 14 and 15. He causes the grass to grow for the cattle and vegetation for the service of man, that he may bring forth food from the earth and wine that makes glad the heart of man, oil to make his face shine, and bread which strengthens man's heart. Yes, God has even given us wine to enjoy. And many people are familiar with the fact that Jesus Christ's first miracle was turning water into wine. So while wine may be enjoyable, the Bible cautions us against overindulgence in wine or other intoxicating beverages. It even depicts a rather humorous caricature of a drunkard. Who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? Those who linger long at the wine. At the last it bites like a serpent and stings like a viper. Your eyes will see strange things and your heart will utter perverse things. Yes, you will be like one who lies down in the midst of the sea or like one who lies at the top of the mast saying, they have struck me but I was not hurt. They have beaten me, but I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may seek another drink? There are numerous warnings against overindulgence in both food and drink. Do not mix with wine bibbers or with gluttonous eaters of meat. Nowhere does the Bible condemn eating meat or products such as milk and butter that come from animals. Nevertheless, there are some meats that the Bible does tell us to avoid. And in this, we find the connection between God's instruction book and SARS. Yes, God has given us so much, and He wants us to enjoy this physical life. In the book of Ecclesiastes, King Solomon explored what it was that would give meaning to life. But his experiment left him discouraged, and even at the point of suicide. He tried wine, women, song, dance, great building projects, and even laughter. Again and again, he repeated this mournful refrain, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. However, while he recognized the futility of this life, if that is all there is, he did have something to say about how we approach our day-to-day -day lives in the flesh. Here is what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life which God gives him, for it is his heritage. If you would like to discover more about how this topic impacts your life, 
visit us online at www.lcgcanada.org to read our featured literature free of charge. My friends, God wants us to enjoy the fruits of our labors. He wants us to enjoy the good things that he has put on this earth for our food. Consider all the wonderful fruits he has given us, apples, oranges, pomelo, and dragon fruit. Consider all the vegetables such as bok choy and bitter melon, silk squash, eggplant, and lotus root, and so much more. Now consider this. Animals eat primarily by instinct. They don't have to be taught. Crabs and lobsters eat any kind of dead creature they come across. Pigs and dogs will even consume their own waste. Crows and vultures enjoy what we sometimes call as roadkill. As mature adults, we wouldn't think of eating these things, but a very small child may sample them if left to himself. This is why loving parents guide their children in what is good for them, teaching them that taste is not all that counts. Some things taste good and are also nutritious and beneficial. Other things may taste good, but they may make us sick or even kill us. Shellfish, such as clams and oysters, are marvelous creatures in that they clean our oceans and rivers by filtering out toxins from the water. But when we eat them, we take those filtered toxins into our bodies. The United States Center for Disease Control says this, Oysters and other shellfish are common sources of foodborne illness. Other creatures contain parasites that can be transferred to humans. While these parasites may be harmless to animals, they can be harmful and even deadly to humans who inadvertently consume them. For example, trichinosis is a small worm that lives in the muscle tissue of pigs and bears and rats and some other animals. Sickness and even death caused by this hardy worm is still a major problem in much of the underdeveloped world but it is considered a rarity in most developed countries due to the strict standards of what can be fed hogs and knowledge among the general population that pork products should be thoroughly cooked. Yet as the famous American actor, Yul Brynner, who played the part of Pharaoh in the movie The Ten Commandments found out, it can still be found or contracted even in the finest restaurants. A July-August 1982 Saturday Evening Post article had this to say about this hardy parasite. Trichinosis is generally believed to be a rarity. This view, though hallucinated, meaning deceptive, is not altogether without explanation. Outbreaks of trichinosis are seldom widely publicized. They are seldom even recognized. Trichinosis is the chameleon of diseases. As a diagnostic deadfall, it is practically unique. The number and variety of ailments with which it is more or less commonly confused approach the encyclopedic. They include arthritis, acute alcoholism, conjunctivitis, food poisoning, lead poisoning, heart disease, laryngitis, mumps, asthma, rheumatism, rheumatic fever, rheumatic myocarditis, gout, tuberculosis, frontal sinusitis, Influenza, nephritis, peptic ulcer, appendicitis, cholecystitis, malaria, scarlet fever, typhoid fever, paratyphoid fever, undulant fever, encephalitis, gastroenteritis, intercoastal neuritis, tetanus, pleurisy, colitis, meningitis, syphilis, typhus, and cholera. With all the rich inducements to error, a sound diagnosis of trichinosis is rarely made. Wow! How come that was never taught in school? Some years ago, a close friend told me a story about his 10-year-old son, Johnny. His mother and father taught him about trichinosis, and as a family, they avoided eating pork products. One day during school lunchtime, Johnny's teacher was understandably concerned when she saw him not eating. And so she asked him, are you feeling okay? And he replied, I'm feeling fine. Then why aren't you eating your hot dog, she inquired. Because it has pork in it, he responded. Well, Johnny, what's wrong with that, she asked, curiously. He then explained, pork has worms in it. Oh, that's okay, his teacher responded with relief. 
When you cook the hot dog, it kills the worms. Yes, Johnny replied, but I don't want to eat dead worms. You know, it's pretty hard to argue with that kind of 10-year-old wisdom. Going back to the Saturday Evening Post article again, it explains, Although medical science is unable to terminate or even lessen the severity of an assault of trichinosis, no disease is easier to dodge. There are several dependable means of evasion. Abstention from pork is, of course, one. It is also the most venerable, having been known, vigorously recommended, and widely practiced for at least 3,000 years. Some authorities, in fact, regard the mosaic prescription of pork as a pioneering step in the development of preventive medicine. For most people, pigs taste good. But are they good for us? And besides trichinosis, is there any other downside to raising them for food? In a recent Reuters news story out of Hong Kong, we learned the following. The H1N1 swine flu virus is compatible with a bird flu virus that is endemic in poultry in Asia, and they can produce hybrid viruses packed with greater killing power, Chinese researchers warned on Monday. Experts believe that a classic way for hybrid viruses to form is when different viruses meet and marry inside a single host, swapping genes. Humans and animals, such as pigs, can be efficient mixing vessels. Some scientists believe the pandemics of 1958 and 68 occurred in such a fashion, killing up to 2 million and 1 million people worldwide, respectively. What scientists are learning is how animal viruses can be transmitted to humans and vice versa. And domestic pigs seem to be excellent mixing vessels. Birds, which are a source of various flu viruses, can transmit the flu to humans, but the human-to-human -human transmission does not normally occur. But when a virus is transmitted from a bird to a pig, it can mutate in such a way that it is now able to transmit not only from pigs to humans, but from human to human. This has been a concern with the H5N1 variety of bird flu, which was first detected in Guangdong province among geese. Apparently, it does not transmit easily to humans, but when it does, it is deadly. Approximately 60% of those who contract H5N1 die from it, and it seems to be more deadly among the young and healthy. One can only imagine what it could do if it were transmitted human to human. And there is a clear understanding that, well, in the case of H5N1, the chances are low. It cannot be discounted, as this article explains. We found that influenza A, H5N1 viruses, have been transmitted multiple times to pig populations in Indonesia, and that one virus has acquired the ability to recognize human-type receptors. Of particular concern is that pigs infected with influenza A, H5N1 viruses, showed no significant influenza-like signs and were likely transported to and from different provinces in Indonesia. On the basis of our findings, we encourage the Indonesian government to control the transport of pigs within Indonesia. Otherwise, opportunities for this avian virus to adapt to mammals will increase as will the risk for emergence of a new pandemic influenza virus. The great swine flu pandemic of 1918 demonstrates what can happen. Estimates of death range between 20 and 40 million people worldwide, when the population of the Earth was much less, international travel was slower, and people were less concentrated in huge cities. Consider what could happen today. The Bible labels certain animals fit for human consumption. But when men improperly care for them, even those animals cause disease in humans. For example, when British cattle were fed processed animal flesh mixed with grain, something cows would never eat on their own, the results were disastrous. BSE, more popularly known as mad cow disease. And there are many other unnatural processes used in the production of animals otherwise fit for human consumption. But let me bring this discussion back to SARS. It did not have to happen. If mankind respected the creator of man and followed his instruction book, SARS, BSE,
flu pandemics and a host of other diseases need not be feared. Scientists are not ignorant of how these diseases originate and spread. Researchers from Hong Kong and China knew that there had to be a source for SARS, and they found it where they expected, in the meat market. There they found the civet cat carrying the SARS virus. Some were cautious to blame it on this creature, but the evidence was so strong that a number of thousands of them had to be slaughtered. And civet cats were outlawed from being served in restaurants, although reports suggest that they still are in some places. While leaders, scientists, and healthcare professionals from many nations try to sort out the lessons from SARS, virtually none is willing to admit the most important, the creator God of the Bible designed some creatures to be eaten by man and some creatures were to be left alone. Sadly, this lesson will not be learned at this time, and flus, SARS, and other exotic pandemics will continue to ravage the earth unnecessarily. The Bible lists animals that God intended for human consumption, and which ones are to be avoided. The civet cat is among those to be avoided. If you'd like to learn which birds, fish, animals, and insects God tells us to eat, and which ones to avoid, turn in the Bible to Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy 14. And be sure to go to our website that will be shown on the screen to learn more about today's topic. And please come back to Tomorrow's World next week. Same place, same time. See you then. If you would like to discover more about how this topic impacts your life, visit us online at www.lcgcanada.org to read our featured literature free of charge. The preceding program is produced by the Living Church of God.